Welcome back students. Now in this video, let's discuss about pelvic organ prolapse. Most of the students feel this topic a very difficult. But in this video, I will try my best to make the concept as easy as possible. Okay. Now without any further delay, let's start our topic. So what exactly I mean by pelvic organ prolapse? In the name itself, it's very clear that the pelvic organs are getting prolapsed. So what is that pelvic organ which is getting prolapsed? It's the uterus. So uterus is getting prolapsed from its place into the vagina or even out of the vagina into the external world. So to give you more idea, I will show you more videos. So the concept will be more clear. But now see in this slide, these images are depicting that the uterus is exposing to the outside world which should be called as pelvic organ prolapse as definition says that please concentrate protrusion of the pelvic organs into the vaginal canal or even out of the vaginal canal should be called as prolapse and how many types of prolapse are there guys it's a utero cervical prolapse and vaginal prolapse in this video in the beginning, I will be mainly discussing about the utero cervical prolapse. Later, I will be discussing about the vaginal prolapse. To make the concept more clear, now please watch this video. Guys, please first know where exactly the uterus is there. See here, this is the uterus, this is the bladder and posteriorly you are going to have a rectum. Now, please watch this video. The uterus from its place, it's falling to the outside world. In the same video, you can also see that the urinary bladder, it is also falling posteriorly and it is also getting exposed. And even here, the rectum, it's also falling and even the rectum is also getting exposed to the outside world. So, here in this video, simultaneously, there is uterocervical prolapse anteriorly there is cystocele what does it mean by cystocele guys cystocele is the protrusion of the bladder or herniation of the bladder from its side to the external world so that is cystocele anteriorly is present and even posteriorly you can see rectocele is there so please uh, one more time watch this video guys yeah like this now in this video, I will be showing more videos so that the concept will be clear. Now, guys, let me ask you one question. Why there is this prolapse? Norm in a normal female, there is no prolapse. Why? Why? Because in a normal healthy female, the uterus have certain supports. What are those supports? Muscular supports are there. Ligamentous supports are there. And even mechanical supports are there. Now, because of the presence of these supports, uterus is fixed in its place and it's not getting herniated or protruded into the vaginal canal or into the external world. So, now let's see those supports one by one. Guys, the first support I'm going to talk about and the main support is the muscular supports. What is that muscular support which is keeping the uterus in its place? The main support is the pelvic diaphragm which is made up of Leviator ani muscles. Now, this leviator ani muscle, it's not a single muscle, but it's a group of two muscles. What are they? Pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus. See, this pubococcygeus and iliococcygeus, these two muscles, they are going to form the pelvic diaphragm, and this pelvic diaphragm is a major support for the uterus. Let me show you. Imagine that if this is the uterus, uterus is sitting on this pelvic diaphragm something like this okay so on the base the uterus is supported by this pelvic diaphragm just imagine that if this pelvic diaphragm is getting weakened what happens the uterus simply protrudes out or falls down that can lead to pelvic organ prolapse or utero cervical prolapse now the question is why these muscles gets weakened see you can see on my top that these muscles okay these muscles are nothing but the leviator ani muscles and they are forming the pelvic diaphragm now these muscles are innervated by this is the mcq 
these muscles are innervated by the pudendal nerve if there is any damage to this pudendal nerve if there is any damage to this pudendal nerve what happens now these muscles are no longer going to maintain their tone if these muscles are no longer going to maintain their tone they will become laxed they will become very weakened so that they will be no longer able to support the uterus so what happens the uterus simply protrudes out into the vaginal canal so that can lead to pelvic organ prolapse or utero cervical prolapse so this is the most common cause so what's the most common cause for the utero cervical prolapse the single most important cause is the damage to pudendal nerve okay now after seeing this let's discuss some more important muscles other than levator ani which can support the uterus and even vagina guys please concentrate in this image the muscle which i am highlighting right now okay this red color muscle which i am highlighting right now this is known as the levator ani muscle we have already discussed that levator ani muscles are going to form the pelvic diaphragm and levator ani muscles include what pubococcygeus and iliococcygeus but not the ischiococcygeus important mcq levator ani muscle uh, which is forming the pelvic diaphragm is made up of pubococcygeus iliococcygeus but not the ischiococcygeus okay important mcq now what you can see here which i am highlighting right now this is the pelvic diaphragm okay now there is also one more diaphragm which is supporting the uterus so what is that can you see here which i am highlighting right now in this area see this is nothing but the urogenital diaphragm okay so urogenital diaphragm also supports the uterus to keep the uterus in its place now this urogenital diaphragm it is made up of which muscles and which structures this urogenital diaphragm is made up of deep transverse perineal muscle okay the muscle which you are seeing right now here okay which i am highlighting here is nothing but the deep transverse perineal muscle and this deep transverse perineal muscle superiorly covered by superior fascia inferiorly covered by inferior fascia this inferior fascia okay please concentrate here this green color okay this green color lining okay so that green color lining is the uh, inferior fascia which is also known as a perineal membrane okay please concentrate here what is meant by perineal membrane the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm okay so what i am trying to put into your mind apart from pelvic diaphragm there is also urogenital diaphragm which is made up of deep transverse perineal muscle superior fascia inferior fascia but also the external urethral sphincter which i can't show you in this image but as a part of urogenital diaphragm there is also external urethral sphincter so what i am trying to put into your mind apart from pelvic diaphragm urogenital diaphragm also supports the uterus okay so that is a very important mcq now here most of the students will get confused what is the superficial perineal pouch and deep perineal pouch see though superficial perineal pouch and deep perineal pouch is not relevant to pelvic organ prolapse but here i want to take a moment and show you what exactly is superficial perineal pouch and deep perineal pouch okay see the space between the levator ani muscle okay here this is the levator ani muscle and the urogenital diaphragm superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm so whatever the space which you are seeing here okay this area that is known as a deep perineal pouch okay so deep perineal pouch a deep perineal space it's a space between levator ani muscle and superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm what is superficial perineal pouch then superficial perineal pouch is the space between perineal membrane so what is the perineal membrane guys perineal membrane is nothing but the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm so between the inferior fascia and one more fascia is there known as superficial fascia okay this is superficial fascia not the superior fascia superior fascia is something this now what i am talking is the superficial fascia so between superficial fascia and perineal membrane or inferior fascia whatever the space which is present over here this space 
is known as superficial perineal pouch okay so how many pouches are there guys deep perineal pouch this one deep perineal pouch and the superficial perineal pouch why i am saying this guys please concentrate that in the superficial perineal pouch here the superficial perineal pouch this blue color muzzle which is a present more axially okay more towards the midline see this midline structure will also support the uterus so what is this muzzle guys this is nothing but the bulbospongiosus muzzle so now if someone ask you what are the structures which are supporting the uterus the structures are the pelvic diaphragm which is made up of the levator ani muscle iliococcygeus pubococcygeus okay well and good and also the urogenital diaphragm urogenital diaphragm is made up of deep transverse perineal muscle external urethral sphincter plus the superior fascia and inferior fascia okay well and good now apart from this there is also a muscle known as the bulbospongiosus muscle which is present in the superficial perineal pouch guys now let me tell you one more muscle which is present in the superficial perineal pouch see here i can't show you but let me ask you one question in the deep perineal pouch okay here deep perineal pouch so what exactly is the deep perineal pouch deep perineal pouch is the area between the perineal membrane and the levator ani muscle so here in the deep perineal pouch which muscle is there guys just tell me it is a deep transverse perineal muscle am i right or not yes in the deep perineal pouch there is deep transverse perineal muscle now please answer me in the superficial perineal pouch which muscle will be there superficial transverse perineal muscle so superficial transverse perineal muscle and deep transverse perineal muscle both of them will support the uterus okay so please keep that point in mind now please answer here muscles which are supporting the uterus and vagina there is a mnemonic which is blessed so which muscle guys it is bulbo spongiosus levator ani which is made up of again two muscles this e for external urethral sphincter as well as external anal sphincter s for superficial transverse a perineal muscle and d for deep transverse perineal muscle so these are the structures which are going to support the uterus as well as vagina why i am saying this because you will be getting a question like all of the following muscles are going to support the uterus except so you should know which muscles support the uterus and which muscles not please concentrate that ischiococcygeus okay ischiococcygeus is not a support for the uterus levator ani muscle it's made up of only iliococcygeus and pubococcygeus but not ischiococcygeus bulbospongiosus is going to support the uterus but not ischiocavernosus bulbospongiosus supports but not the ischiocavernosus these are the very important mcqs which will be asked in the exam now after seeing the muscular supports let's go further now let's discuss about the mechanical supports see these are the mechanical structures which are supporting the uterus what are they the angle of antiversion and the angle of antiflexion so what does i mean by angle of antiversion and antiflexion see even in the topic of anatomy we have discussed that the vagina cervix and uterus okay vagina cervix and uterus they are not simply lying longitudinally over one another they are more of angulated okay if this is the if this is the vagina the cervix and uterus they are more angulated there is angle between them okay so they are not simply longitudinal something like this they are angulated so this angle is known as angle of antiversion and antiflexion now here let's take a minute and discuss what exactly is antiversion and antiflexion please concentrate guys here in the vagina there is this a blue line going that is the axis of the vagina so the angle between the axis of vagina v and the axis of the cervix this red line so the cervical axis the cervical axis and the vaginal axis they are making an acute angle of 90 degrees 
so this is known as angle of antiversion v v for vagina and cervix so the angle between vagina and cervix is angle of antiversion so because of this 90 degree angle the uterus is falling over onto the bladder okay now you can clearly see here that the uterus is falling onto the bladder it's not simply straight like this it's falling onto the bladder now bladder is mechanically supporting the uterus okay so that uterus can't fall down okay so the angle of antiversion doesn't allow the uterus to undergo prolapse but what if the antiversion is lost and the uterus is become retroverted once the uterus is become retroverted it can easily undergo prolapse so retroversion of the uterus can lead to prolapse very important mcq now the question is why there is this angle of antiversion okay we all know that uterus is having antiversion okay there, there, there is this angle of antiversion and antiflexion okay we all know that now why antiversion who is making this uterus to flex anteriorly that answer will be given by the round ligament okay so round ligaments are the structures which are pulling the uterus anteriorly okay now let's discuss about the angle of antiflexion i'm going to discuss more about the round ligaments like in the later parts of the same video but for now let's discuss about the angle of antiflexion see what does it mean by angle of antiflexion simply just like before the angle between the axis of the cervix and the angle of between the axis of a uterine body so this angle this obtuse angle of 120 degrees this is known as angle of antiflexion so there is angle of antiversion and angle of antiflexion which keeps the uterus to flex anteriorly and get a mechanical support from the bladder okay now guys please uh, take some important points that retroversion of the uterus can lead to prolapse yes we, we already know that so what is that ligament which helps in antiversion so which ligaments pulls the uterus forward anteriorly it is a round ligament don't worry i am going to show you the image now if someone asks you which ligament prevents the retroversion retroversion of the uterus will cause prolapse but which ligament is preventing the retroversion it is the uterosacral ligament which are very important mcqs okay now after this let's continue guys please concentrate here this is the uterus okay what i am showing you this is the uterus now the structures which are highlighted in green color they are the round ligaments so this is the anterior side and this is the posterior side how can i know that here is the sacrum okay this is the sacrum this is the rectum which you can see this is the rectum now please concentrate we all know that anterior to the uterus which structures are present this is the bladder now this round ligaments which are highlighted in green color they are going something like this anteriorly if they are going anteriorly see on one side they are attached to the uterus on the other side they are getting attached to the anteriorly okay anteriorly they are going to attach onto the labia majora so now they are pulling the uterus anteriorly so that the uterus will become antiverted so the angle of antiversion is maintained by round ligaments even you can see here in this image see this is the uterus now as we have already discussed that the uterus is falling onto the bladder antiverted these ligaments if you can see these ligaments which are moving anteriorly something like this they are pulling the uterus towards the anterior side round ligaments maintain the antiversion okay okay well and good now let's see some important points ligaments which keeps the uterus antiverted and antiflexed answer is round ligament antiflexion is maintained by round ligament now ligaments preventing the retroversion of the uterus we have already discussed what is that it is uterosacral ligament okay well and good now guys here in this image i just want to discuss a more about a few ligaments guys please concentrate these ligaments which are coming posteriorly okay which are coming like you no know, towards the uterus and they are getting attached onto the 
sacrum so this ligaments are known as the uterosacral ligaments from the uterus to the sacrum uterosacral ligaments now here this ligament the fan shaped ligament like you know from the uterus and they are going sides to the bones okay to the uh, pelvis so this ligaments which are attached on one side to the uterus and other side to the pelvic bone these are known as the transverse ligaments these transverse ligaments are also known as cardinal ligaments they are also known as mackenrod ligament three names same ligament so mackenrod's ligament cardinal ligament and transverse ligament they are one and the same now anteriorly you are going to have a one more ligament okay this ligament so this ligament is known as pubo cervical ligament okay pubo cervical ligament so one side it's a pubis and the other side it's getting attached to the cervix so how many ligaments are there there are three main ligament supports these are the main ligament supports see i have discussed about the round ligament but round ligament is not the main primary support round ligament maintains the antiversion true but round ligament is a secondary support so what are the three main ligament supports guys the three main ligament supports which you need to know are the pubo cervical ligament the transverse ligament or mackenrod's ligament and the uterosacral ligament these three ligaments together known as tri radiate ligaments okay tri radiate ligaments now out of all these tri radiate ligaments the question is which is the most powerful ligament at the main support main ligament support out of all these the main ligament supports is mackenrod's ligament or cardinal ligament or the transverse ligament so these are a very important mcqs now let's discuss about the ligament supports now guys the important point to be noted is the tri radiate ligaments are the main primary supports are the main primary ligament as supports see out of overall most important support for the uterus is a muscular support there is no doubt but which ligaments mainly support the uterus tri radiate ligaments after tri radiate ligament even round ligament can support but that's a secondary support have i ever said that the broad ligament is it going to support the uterus to be in its place no broad ligament it's a peritoneal fold okay it's not going to support the uterus okay please important point is broad ligament and round ligament they are not the true supports they are not the primary supports even round ligament is considered as a secondary support but broad ligament is not a support at all this is a very very important mcq you have to keep in mind now after this let's continue further guys please concentrate what are the primary supports already we have discussed pubo cervical ligament cardinal ligament or mackenrod's ligament utero cervical ligament see round ligament is a secondary support okay it's not a primary support primary supports are the tri radiate ligaments okay now which ligament is the not a support at all it's a broad ligament broad ligament is a peritoneal peritoneal it's a covering okay it's it doesn't support uterus at all okay now after this let's see what are the important risk factors which are leading to uterine prolapse or the utero cervical prolapse now please concentrate that we have already discussed that trauma to the pudendal nerve okay trauma to the pudendal nerve is the most important cause for the utero cervical prolapse we have seen now the question is what are the other important risk factors or why the pudendal nerve is getting damaged now let's discuss now let's start from here the traumatic deliveries are birth trauma see there is any trauma during the delivery that can cause the prolapse why see most of the time the prolapse will be seen after the delivery why the question is because of the faulty instrumentation see if you apply if the obstetrician is applying the vacuum or the forceps inappropriately for example a forceps should be applied in order to take out the baby when if the cervix is fully dilated when the cervix is fully dilated then that's the moment you have to apply the forceps if there is a, a prolonged second stage of labor 
okay okay let me make it more simple there is prolonged second stage of labor now the baby is not coming out then you have to apply the forceps okay it's okay but in order to apply the forceps there should be total cervical dilation 10 cm cervical dilation should be there if there is only 6 cm dilation or if there is only 7 cm dilation now if you are applying the forceps this forceps can cause a damage to the cervix it can cause cervical lacerations or inadvertent application okay inadvertent application of this forceps can cause tears in the ligaments so whenever the ligaments are tear you are simply taking out the ligament as support for the uterus so the uterus can fall after the delivery so this is what can happen or if you are using this vacuum or forceps inadvertently or inappropriately that can damage the pudendal nerve so whenever the pudendal nerve is damaged that will decrease the tone to the pelvic diaphragm so whenever you are taking out the tone from the pelvic diaphragm that uterus can simply fall out so traumatic deliveries are because of faulty instrumentation and that will lead to pudendal nerve damage or if there is a ligament tears because of inappropriate use of this vacuum or forceps that can lead to genital prolapse through repeated childbirths what happens if there is repeated childbirth or multiparity more number of deliveries more the muscles will get weakened okay see a baby is pushing okay during normal vaginal delivery baby is pushing against the pelvic diaphragm am i right or not yes so in that process these muscles get too much fatigue too many deliveries too much fatigue they will become more lax they will they will become more less toned so that will take out the muscular support from the uterus and that may lead to uterine prolapse true precipitate labor what does it mean what does i mean by precipitate labor very fast labor okay the labor is come com getting completed in a very short time so whenever there is a precipitate labor the muscles are getting too much contracted they might get cramped or getting fatigued so that will take out the uh, muscular support why because the muscles are getting fatigued so whenever they are fatigued they lost their tone so simply uterus can fall down now in the same way prolonged labor especially prolonged second stage of labor what does i mean by prolonged labor in the second stage of labor is getting more than 2 hours in a nulliparous or getting more than 1 hour in a multiparous female if there is too much amount of time if it's taking too much amount of time baby is getting stuck over there baby's head is getting compressed again is the pelvic diaphragm so whenever the baby's head is getting compressed again is the pelvic diaphragm what happens because of this mechanical pressure what happens the blood supply to this pelvic diaphragm is getting compromised or if the baby's head is getting compressed again is the pelvic diaphragm even this will decrease the blood flow to the pudendal nerve so there is ischemia getting developed in this area so whenever there is ischemia they will become fatigue or there will be damage to the pudendal nerve so this will decrease the tone of this uh, pelvic structures or the pelvic diaphragm and that can lead to prolapse true now certain conditions like marfan syndrome ehlers danlos syndrome see these are connective tissue disorders now here in the marfan syndrome we all know that there is a fibrillin defect okay fibrillin gene defect now because of this marfan syndrome or ehlers danlos syndrome the connective tissue is not properly formed we all know that connective tissue is a part of muscles connective tissue is a part of ligaments so whenever there is a connective tissue defects the pelvic diaphragm is not properly made or the ligament supports are not properly made so whenever the muscular diaphragm is not properly made it is not able to hold the uterus properly in its place or the ligaments are not tight enough to hold the uterus in its place that can lead to protrusion of uterus from its place to the outside world so that can lead to prolapse or heavy lift bearing after the delivery for example or early resumption of work after delivery now what does i mean by there is a female she just have delivered okay two days back and now she is back into her work she is uh, doing her household work so she is lifting heavy weights lifting these heavy weights increases the intra abdominal pressure why because still this uterus is a abdominal organ 
Now, because of the increased intra-abdominal pressure, this pressure will kink the uterus down. So, that can lead to prolapse. So, early resumption of work or heavy lift bearing or the conditions which are associated with the increased intra-abdominal pressure like heavy um, weight bearing or severe cuff, ascites or constipation, all this will increase the intra-abdominal pressure that will push the uterus down and that can lead to prolapse. Now, let's talk about the spina bifida. We all know that spina bifida is due to non-closure of the posterior neural pore. Now, if a female is having this spina bifida, then there will be decrease in neuronal tone to the pelvic diaphragm. Okay, the neuronal supply, the neuronal innervation to her pelvic diaphragm is not that good. So, her pelvic diaphragm is not tight enough to hold the uterus. So, what happens? Now, that can simply lead to prolapse. So, all these are the conditions in a female which can lead to a prolapse. Now, after seeing these risk factors, let's continue. Now, let's see the clinical symptoms. Now, just please think logically and say, if the uterus, if it is coming into the vaginal canal or even if it is coming outside world, now what the patient feels? The patient will feel like there is some dragging sensation in her vagina and the patient will feel that something is coming out of her vagina. So, the most common symptom, what a patient feel with the genital prolapse is something coming out of the vagina or the dragging sensation. Okay, well and good. Now, because of the prolapse, please understood, the uterus is supported by pubocervical ligaments, transverse ligaments and uterosacral ligaments. All these ligaments are holding the uterus in its place. But whenever there is a prolapse, these ligaments are also getting stretched. Okay, these ligaments along with the prolapsed uterus, they are stretched down. So, what happens? The stretching of these ligaments, especially uterosacral ligaments, will cause a groin or back pain in this female. So, female will say that she is having this groin pain or back pain and she will also say that something is coming out of my vagina. Now, there will be difficult urinating and defecating. Why there is uh, difficult urinating and defecating, uh, defecation guys? Why? Because, see, most of the time that this uh, uterocervical prolapse is associated with the cystocele anteriorly. So, whenever there is a cystocele, that's the prolapsing of the bladder. So, whenever the urinary bladder is prolapsed, do you think that there will be a normal maturation? No, there will be difficult maturation. So, there will be difficulty in urinating as well as difficulty in uh, defecating. Why? Because there is rectocele, maybe associated with the rectocele posteriorly. Okay, we don't Now, there is increased risk of a UTI. Why there is increased risk of UTI? Well, because there is urinary retention because of the cystocele. That can lead to a urinary infections or even stone formation, nephrolithiasis. Okay, so because of the hydroureters, hydronephrosis, there will be stone formation, there will be urinary tract infections in this female. True, and that because of the urinary tract infection, the female can even have the leukocytosis and fever also. Now, so what about this ducubitus ulcer? Okay, very important MCQ for the exam. Guys, please concentrate here on the top of my head. You are seeing an image where you can see ulcers which are getting developed over the uterus. So, these ulcers are known as the decubitus ulcer. What exactly is a decubitus ulcer? This decubitus ulcer is because of the venous congestion. See, whenever the uterus is getting prolapsed outside, do you think that there will be a proper blood supply to it? No, the blood supply is compromised. Okay, so the blood is getting accumulated in the tissue. There is a venous congestion. Now, when the uterus is falling down, because of the friction, now the uterus is present between the two thighs. Now, because of the friction, there may be development of a small ulcer. And now this ulcer is not getting healed. Why it's not getting healed? Because there is no proper blood supply. Because of the venous congestion, now these ulcers which are because of the friction, they are known as decubitus ulcer. Main MCQ is decubitus ulcer is because of the venous congestion. Okay, this is the MCQ. Now, so how we can treat this decubitus ulcer? That main treatment is reposition. Okay. C. 
see this is not the management of the genital prolapse or the uterine prolapse see reposition simply reposition and giving this uh, actriflavin and glycerin is not the management option for the uterocervical prolapse see reposition after reposition you are going to completely pack the uterine cavity with the acriflavin and glycerin see this is the treatment which you are going to do to treat the decubitus sulcer because of the venous congestion okay so this is not the management for the whole uh, uterocervical prolapse okay now let's discuss about congenital prolapse what does i mean by congenital prolapse in the name itself it's very clear congenital because of certain congenital reasons there is prolapse please concentrate guys usually prolapse is something seen in older ages okay please concentrate here because of menopause the pelvic diaphragm got weakened and the pelvic the pelvic diaphragm got less tone so that it is no longer able to support the uterus so menopause is a important reason it's one of the important reason for the uterine prolapse but why a female who is very young can have a prolapse even the prolapse can be seen in a 10 year old or 15 year old usually prolapse is something seen in older age women or prolapse is something seen after the delivery why prolapse is happening in a female who is very young because of certain congenital reasons where the connective tissues are not properly developed or for example like in spina bifida where the neuronal tone is not properly maintained so what exactly is congenital prolapse a prolapse seen in very young females young nulliparous females she haven't even delivered but there is prolapse because of certain connective tissue disorders like marfan syndrome ehlers danlos syndrome uh, uh, spina, uh, spina bifida osteogenesis imperfecta okay so in these conditions if a female is having uterine prolapse means then we are going to call it as congenital prolapse now from here we are going to discuss about the management for the genital prolapse let's start the management guys for example if there is this congenital prolapse in a young female a nulliparous female there is prolapse now does she want to have her future pregnancy or not definitely she want to have her future pregnancy or there is this young female who is not having congenital prolapse but she is a young female she want to have a future pregnancy now in this group if there is prolapse means how we are going to manage congenital prolapse and a young female who is desiring the future pregnancy now here in the reproductive age group women we are going to mainly perform two types of surgeries in a young reproductive age group women two surgeries are advised what are they sling surgeries one followed by fothergill manchester surgery okay now first let's discuss about the sling surgery see if there is this congenital prolapse the management is sling surgery okay so what exactly is this sling sling is nothing but the material which we are using as a sling in this condition is merceline tape okay here what you are seeing is a merceline tape it's a synthetic compound now what exactly is this merceline tape merceline tape is nothing but a mechanical device or a mechanical structure which is a flexible it just like a strap or a belt which is used okay this strap is used to hold the uterus okay already uterus is prolapsed okay uterus uh, let me show you uterus is prolapsed outside so now what i have to do i have to support this uterus how i can support this uterus i will use this sling okay imagine that this is a sling i am going to use this sling and i am going to keep the uterus in its place something like this so simply i can say that i am using this slings as ligaments okay so i am just recreating the ligaments by using this slings so that the uterus will stay in its place okay so this is the treatment of option which i will be doing in a female who is going to have a congenital prolapse or a young female of reproductive age who is desiring the future pregnancy so what is that synthetic material i am going to use it's a merceline tape now sling surgery see if this is the uterus okay this is the uterus now i can use an anterior sling or i can use the posterior sling okay imagine that this is the anterior sling and this is the posterior sling See, there are two types of slings. Slings available. Anterior sling examples. Okay, one is 
புரந்தரே ஸ்லிங் ஓகே புரந்தரே ஸ்லிங் அண்ட் கண்ணா ஸ்லிங் ஓகே ஸோ எக்ஸாம்பிள்ஸ் ஆஃப் ஆன்டீரியர் ஸ்லிங் ஆர் புரந்தரே ஸ்லிங் அண்ட் கண்ணா ஸ்லிங் ஸோ வாட் எக்ஸாக்ட்லி ஐ மீன் பை ஆன்டீரியர் ஸ்லிங் விச் மீன்ஸ் the sling on one side is attached to the uterus on the other side the sling is getting attached anteriorly so that it is going to support the uterus what does i mean by posterior sling posterior sling means on one side sling is getting attached to the uterus on the other side the sling is getting attached posteriorly to the abdominal wall now we will discuss where exactly they are getting attached don't worry now please concentrate here that the examples of anterior sling are purandare sling and kanna sling see this purandare sling is an example of anterior sling right so it is getting attached anteriorly to the rectus fascia okay we are going to have the six pack muscle right that rectus sheath so the purandare sling on one side it's getting attached to the uterus on the other side it is getting attached to the rectus fascia and this kanna sling even it's a example of anterior sling so on one side it is getting attached to the uterus on the other side it is getting attached to the anterior superior iliac spine means it is attaching to the bone okay single point now what are the examples of posterior sling examples of posterior sling are shirodhkar sling now on one side the shirodhkar sling is getting attached to the uterus on the other side the shirodhkar sling is getting attached to the sacrum posteriorly okay now let's see some important mcqs guys let's talk about the kanna sling first kanna sling is associated with osteitis why why because kanna sling anteriorly it is getting attached to the anterior superior iliac spine so this can cause inflammation of that point leading to osteitis true now let's talk about the purandare sling purandare sling it's an anterior sling it's an example of a dynamic sling dynamic means it's a movement it can move what what does i mean by exactly see rectus fascia is it a single point is it a single point or not no it's not a single point it's a fascia it's a it's a very large structure so anywhere over that fascia you can attach this sling so it's not a one single point so purandare sling is an example of a dynamic sling it can be attached anywhere over the rectus fascia but kanna sling where it is getting attached it is getting attached over the anterior superior iliac spine anterior superior iliac spine is a single point so it's an example of a static sling yes now anterior sling surgeries are very much like you know having less complications but the success rate is a bit less now after discussing the anterior slings now let's discuss a few more important points about the posterior sling so what exactly is the posterior sling guys it is the shirodhkar sling posteriorly it's getting attached onto the sacrum now let's discuss some important points now shirodhkar sling it's an example of posterior sling okay it's a static sling it's not a dynamic sling it's a static sling why it is a static sling why because see here this is the uterus okay imagine that this is the uterus or cervix now here the sling on one side is getting attached to the uterus and it is traveling posteriorly please concentrate it is traveling posteriorly and it is getting sutured over the sacral promontory am i right or not yes on one side it's the uterus on the posterior side it is getting attached onto a single point which is the sacral promontory so it's a single point so it's a static sling okay it's not a dynamic sling it's a static sling now one side it's the uterus isthmus of the uterus and the other side it's getting attached over the sacral promontory now please think logically out of all the triradiate ligament pubo cervical transverse ligament and uterosacral ligament uterosacral ligament means on one side the ligaments are getting attached to the uterus on the other side the ligaments are getting attached to the sacrum so utero sacral ligament okay utero sacral ligament now this sling this shirodhkar sling it mimics the utero sacral ligament am i right or not yes why because even this 
sling on one side it is getting attached to the uterus isthmus of the uterus on the other side it is getting attached to the sacrum so utero sacral ligament so all these are the important points about the shirodhkar sling okay guys please concentrate that anterior sling surgeries have less complications we have already seen please concentrate here anterior sling surgeries have less complications but also success rate is less but if i am talking about the posterior sling which is the shirodhkar sling it is having more complications what are the more complications guys please concentrate in this image when the sling is coming on the left side okay when the sling is coming on the left side there is a structure this green color structure what is this green color structure this is the genito femoral nerve see when the mercillin tape when it's coming posteriorly especially on the left side this genito femoral nerve can be damaged okay and especially on the left side there is one structure which is depicted as c what is this structure this is sigmoid colon and this sigmoid colon may gets obstructed because of the sling so the posterior sling surgeries have more complications and especially on which side guys especially on the left side so what are the complications there can be obstruction of the sigmoid colon or there can be damage to the genito femoral nerves or even the mesenteric vessels can be damaged and there can be a ureteric injury so posterior sling surgeries more complications especially on the left side and what are the complication guys the main complications are the obstruction to the sigmoid colon or damage to the genito femoral nerve or the mesenteric vessels or there can be ureteric damage okay guys we have seen the anterior sling surgeries okay which are something like this a sling is getting attached on one side to the uterus and other side to the anteriorly either onto the rectus of fascia or onto the anterior superior iliac spine we have seen we have also seen the posterior sling surgeries complications are seen with the posterior sling surgeries we have seen so in order to take out the complications because of posterior sling surgeries now we are going to have a hybrid sling so what is this hybrid sling guys please answer my question complication with the posterior sling are seen on which side left side so avoid avoid posterior sling surgery on the left side so have a posterior sling surgery on a right side okay have a posterior sling surgery on a right side and on the left side have an anterior sling surgery that is the purandare sling so what is this hybrid sling hybrid sling is also known as a virkut sling so what exactly is this virkut sling this virkut sling main purpose is to take out the complications of the posterior sling surgery especially on the left side so we are going to have a hybrid sling where on the left side we are going to have a anterior sling on the right side we are going to place a posterior sling so please concentrate in this image guys in this image on the left side which type of sling is there it is a purandare sling okay it's a purandare sling anterior sling and on the right side see we are going to have a posterior sling which is a shirodhkar sling so this is known as a composite sling or virkut sling okay so this is a very very important on the right side there is shirodhkar sling on the left side there is purandare sling now guys please concentrate okay on the management of prolapse okay we are continuing the management of prolapse see so far the sling surgery is completed we have seen that the sling surgery is the main option especially for the congenital prolapse or the prolapse in a young female who is desiring the pregnancy now i just want to say one important mcq over here okay so please take that see in order to perform this sling surgery which is also known as cervicopexy in order to perform the sling surgery utero utero cervical length utero cervical length we all know that there is a ratio between the uterus and cervix we have already discussed this in the part of anatomy the utero cervical length should be normal if you want to perform this sling surgery then the utero cervical length should be normal now let's continue further guys there is a female young female who is not desiring any future child okay now there is a female and she don't want to have any 
future child she doesn't want now she want to have to continue her menstrual cycle see there is this young female who don't want to have any of her future pregnancy but she want to continue her menstrual cycle so now what is the treatment of choice should you have to do sling surgery in this female no sling surgery is done in a female who is desiring the pregnancy now in this type of females then the best management will be for the girls are manchester surgery now in this for the girls are manchester repair what exactly is being done we are going to do there are two steps the first step is we are going to do cervical amputation okay see uh, let me show you here that this is the uterus okay and this is the vagina okay so this part is what this is the cervix we all know that is the cervix especially that is the portion of vagina is towards the cervix now what we are going to do is we are going to just simply chop out this cervix that is the cervical amputation is the first step now if you take out if you just chop out this cervix there will be formation of lots of adhesions in this area okay there will be formation of lots of adhesions now these adhesions are going to create a mechanical barrier okay just reposition the uterus if there is a prolapsed uterus reposition the uterus just chop out the cervix if you chop out the cervix there will be formation of lots of adhesions and these adhesions now going to give the mechanical support so that this uterus is not going to fall down back so this is the first step along with the cervical amputation there is a second step which is known as a plication of the cardinal ligament or the mackenrodt's ligament these two are the main important steps cervical amputation along with the plication of the cardinal ligament what exactly is this plication of the cardinal ligament guys please understand that if this is the uterus i am just showing you from the lateral view lateral view see posteriorly a very strong ligament is there what is that uterosacral ligament transversely a very very strong powerful ligament out of all the triradiate ligaments what is that the transverse ligament is there see posteriorly there is very good support that is the uterosacral ligament and sideways there are this transverse ligaments or mackenrodt's ligaments are there okay these are also well and good but anteriorly the pubo cervical ligaments they are not the toughest ligaments they are not as strong as the cardinal ligaments or the uterosacral ligaments so now what we are going to do posteriorly there is very good support but anteriorly there is not that much support so what we are going to do we are going to take this transverse ligaments or cardinal ligaments and we are going to plicate this ligaments anteriorly we are going to take this ligaments and attach this ligaments anteriorly so that anteriorly now there are this transverse ligaments or cardinal ligaments posteriorly now we have this uterosacral ligaments so from both the sides there is a very powerful ligamentous support so this is what is being done in the second step of the fothergill's manchester surgery so the first step is cervical amputation creating the adhesions and those adhesions are creating a mechanical barrier so that the uterus is not falling down and the second step is the plication of the cardinal or mackenrodt's ligament okay taking those mackenrodt's ligaments from the transverse side and we are taking and attaching them anteriorly okay so this is the second step guys important point is this cervical amputation is not good as you think why because this can lead to second trimester recurrent abortions first of all our lady this uh, female she doesn't want to have any future child who knows if she changes her mind and in the future she is desiring the pregnancy now you have already amputated her cervix now that can cause second trimester recurrent abortions because of cervical incompetence right? because she lost her cervix now if she get pregnancy then simply the cervix can dilate that is the cervical incompetence so that can lead to second trimester recurrent abortions or you have chopped out the cervix then because of too much amount of he healing or too much amount of the scar formation there can be a cervical stenosis okay that cervical stenosis doesn't allow the menstrual blood to come out 
so all these are the complications because of the cervical amputation so this is not as good as you think so now what we are doing is we are taking out the cervical amputation we are only doing the plication of the cardinal ligament then this should be called as Schroeder's modification of further gills repair see please concentrate further gills repair or further gills surgery includes both further gills manchester repair includes both the cervical amputation and plication of the cardinal ligaments but out of these two which is not good cervical amputation is not good so if you don't perform cervical amputation if you only perform plication of the cardinal ligament then that should be called as schroedkers modification of further gills repair where only plication of the cardinal ligaments is performed cervical amputation is not performed is it going to be good yes better than the further gills manchester repair why why because there is no complication of cervical stenosis there is no complication of second trimester recurrent abortions there is no complication of that a cervical incompetence if she want to have a future child there won't be any complications okay so shirodka modification of further gills repair is a surgery where you are not performing the cervical amputation okay now let's go further guys now we are discussing the management of uterine prolapse in a reproductive age group women see in a reproductive age group women you can perform two types of surgeries what are they either you can perform a sling surgery or either you can perform a further gills manchester repair you can perform two types of surgeries but when to perform sling surgery and when to perform a further gills manchester repair it depends on it depends on whether she is desiring her future pregnancy and it also depends on her utero cervical length please concentrate there is this young female 15 year old or 10 year old does she desire future pregnancy or not definitely she will desire future pregnancy why because she is not a pregnant at all since okay uh, till now she is not a pregnant she is a very young definitely she want to have babies in her future so now in a young if there is a prolapse definitely you are going to call it as a congenital prolapse what about the status of the future pregnancy it is desired yes and what about the utero cervical length if if utero cervical length is the normal then what type of surgery i am going to do i am going for the sling surgery okay now there is this reproductive age group women and she is also desiring her future pregnancy she is nulliparous or maybe she is not nulliparous but she want to have her like you know a pregnancy in the future and her utero cervical length is also normal now what is the management again sling surgery okay now there is this reproductive age group women and she doesn't want to have any future pregnancy and also guys please remember that her utero cervical length is increased guys the moment utero cervical length is increased you are not going to do sling surgery then what you are going to do if the utero cervical length is increased you are going to chop out that extra length of the cervix so what is that it is further gills let me show you it is further gills manchester further gills are manchester repair okay now there is this reproductive age group woman she is desiring her future pregnancy yes reproductive age she want to have a future pregnancy usually what we will do we will do sling surgery but see her utero cervical length is increased if her utero cervical length is increased are you going to do a sling surgery no usually reproductive age and future pregnancy is desired what you have to do you have to do a sling surgery but once utero cervical length is increased the sling surgery is, is not able like you know you are not going to do the sling surgery what you have to do is again for the gills or manchester repair should be done okay so this is what you have to know and this is the place definitely where you are going to get your mcqs okay now let's go further now there is this elderly female this is a separate question okay this is a separate case reproductive age group women completed now we are going to jump into an area where our woman is a elderly female this is elder female and definitely if she is elder 45 years or 50 years 
definitely she don't want to have any future pregnancy or she don't want to have any her menstrual function no pregnancy no menstrual function she is almost elderly female now she is having this prolapse okay her uterus is hang, hanging out what you can do the best you can do is hysterectomy she is elderly female so you can without any doubt you can go for the ward myo vaginal hysterectomy what exactly is this ward myo vaginal hysterectomy here you are going to do a vaginal hysterectomy okay via vaginal route you are going to take out the uterus along with the vaginal hysterectomy along with the vaginal hysterectomy you are going to do the pelvic floor repair okay it's a part of ward myo vaginal hysterectomy along with that plus or minus you can or you cannot okay depends totally depends on you okay you can do sacrospinous colpopexy okay we are going to discuss what exactly is the sacrospinous colpopexy in a minute but please remember there is this elderly female who don't want to have any future pregnancy or who don't want to new or don't want to continue her menstrual cycle then what you can simply do our best possible management is hysterectomy ward myo hysterectomy vaginal hysterectomy along with the pelvic floor repair plus or minus sacrospinous colpopexy now let's discuss about one more case same elderly female there is the same elderly female now this female okay please please concentrate here okay uh, just wait guys let's don't talk about the elderly female now right now don't talk about the elderly female just for a minute let's think about there is this female who is very young there is female who is very young normally young females are reproductive age group women what we are going to do we are going to perform sling surgery or we are going to perform father gills manchester repair these are the two options which are available now there is our female who is young but there are certain contra indications for her surgery or she is not like no she is not willing to go for the surgery okay she is refusing or there are certain contra indications for the surgery she is having too much amount of uh, hypertension diabetes whatsoever she is having certain uh, cardiac diseases now in this female we are not going to do the sling surgery or not we are going to do the uh, father wills manchester repair here what we can do is ring pessary okay at the level of ischial spines we are going to put a mechanical device okay a mechanical device we are going to keep at the level of ischial spines and this mechanical device is going to support the falling uterus till the time please remember guys till the time this mechanical device is in its place it won't allow the uterus to fall down don't worry i will show you a video so that the concept will be clear till the time this mechanical device is in its place the uterine prolapse will be stopped but is it going to be a permanent cure no this is not a permanent cure just like a surgery it is a temporary and you know usually these pessaries okay this ring pessary or donut pessary or gel horn pessary there are different types to see for example this is a, a donut pessary this is called as a donut pessary this is a gel horn okay gel horn pessary see these pessaries they are a temporary okay now these pessaries should be removed on a regular basis they should be changed if you fail to do so that can lead to that can lead to vesico vaginal fistulas if you keep them uh, in a place constantly that can cause ischemia in that region that can lead to vesico vaginal fistulas okay now what we are discussing female young female contra indication or refusing what you can do you have to go with the pessary now please concentrate on this image okay it's a video please concentrate that uterus is falling down this is the uterine prolapse what you are seeing is a gel horn pessary okay so on one end you have applied the gel and you are keeping it in the introitus now you are taking this gel horn pessary see this gel horn pessary is repositioning the uterus to its place it's a mechanical support and it is also temporary important mcq now what the other places where you can use this type of pessaries not only in a young who is refusing or having contraindications but these type of pessaries can also be used during pregnancy see there is a pregnant female and now there is this prolapse happened prolapse during pregnancy what you have to do you have to use the ring pessary or 
there is prolapse during puerperium after delivery okay just after delivery the time period is a puerperium right now during puerperium if there is this prolapse what you are going to do the management is done with the ring pessary r please concentrate guys again i am going to repeat this point in the next slide but please concentrate there is this old female with a contraindication to anesthesia there is this old female now she is ha having certain contraindication to surgery and she is also having certain contraindication to anesthesia also you are not supposed to give anesthesia at all now in this conditions you can use this ring pessary okay now please concentrate on this slide see now our female is a old female okay in the before slide our female is a young female young female contraindication to surgery are refusing ring pessary okay but now now our female is a old female she is having certain contraindications to the surgery or if she is refusing now what we can do we can do a simple simple type of uh, surgery which is known as lifort calpoclysis it's not even a big surgery it's not a major surgery it's very simple what we are going to do here See, calpoclysis means, calpo means vagina, clysis means closure. Calpoclysis means, see, if this is the vagina, okay, it's a fibromuscular tube. Now, we are going to scrape, okay, we are going to uh, scrape the walls of the vagina. See, when you are doing this mechanical abrasion, okay, this mechanical abrasion, this mechanical abrasion can create lots of adhesions. So, there will be lots and lots of adhesions which are getting, developing this fibromuscular canal of the vagina. So that because of this adhesions, there will be mechanical support so that uterus won't fall down. Okay. Now, please concentrate that this is the uterus. Okay. Now, this is the vagina. What we have done? We have created adhesions over here. We have created adhesions something like this because of the scraping. Now, these adhesions, do you think logically? These adhesions will allow the uterus to fall down. No, they are now acting as a mechanical barrier. So this is Lefort's calpoclysis, which should be done only in a old females. This Lefort's calpoclysis should never be done. It's contraindicated in young or reproductive females. Why? Because you are totally closing, you are totally occluding the vagina. If you have done so, the coital function is going to be impaired. How can she have her sex? Or if you have totally closed her vagina, how can she have her menses? So, Lefort's calpoclysis is only done in old females more than 65 years of age. And that too, this calpoclysis is done for those females who are having contraindication to surgery. Okay. Now, why I am saying like that? If she is an old female, elderly female, what we have to do ideally? We have to do ward myohysterectomy. If she is having a contraindication for that ward myohysterectomy, then we have to go with the Lefort's calpoclysis. Now, please concentrate. Again, I am repeating. Already I have like you no know, like uh, said this in the before slide, but now I am repeating. See, there is this old female. She is having contraindication to the surgery. Okay. Usually, if she have contraindication to surgery or if she is refusing, what we will do? The fourth scalpoclysis we will do. Even, please concentrate, for performing the scraping of the vagina, the fourth scalpoclysis, it's a painful procedure, right? You are scraping. It needs anesthesia. But our female is having contraindication for surgery or she is refusing. So, she is not going for the the fourth scalpoclysis. Okay, well and good. Also, she is having contraindication to anesthesia. So, if she is having contraindication to anesthesia, you are not supposed to do Lefort scalpoclysis also. Why? Because Lefort scalpoclysis needs anesthesia. So, old female, contraindication to anesthesia. Now, what we can do is the ring pessary. So, in the before slide, I have said ring pessary. It's an option during puerperium. It's an option for the genital prolapse during puerperium during pregnancy or old female who is refusing the surgery or contraindication like you no know, to the surgery and also having contraindication to the anesthesia so now even here you can use the ring pessary okay now let's discuss about vault prolapse what exactly i mean by vault prolapse guys please remember that 
this is the vagina okay imagine that this is a vagina which is a fibromuscular tube here what will be there here there will be uterus okay something like this okay uterus and cervix now a female because of whatever might be the reason she have undergone hysterectomy means you have removed her uterus and cervix okay hysterectomy is performed now this vault okay this stump of the vagina okay this area is sutured something like this now this is called as a vaginal vault now even this vaginal vault can be prolapsed out okay simply this vaginal vault can simply prolapse down so that's what is known as vault prolapse especially seen in those females who have undergone hysterectomy now what we have to do see vault is prolapsed so what you have to do you have to suspend this vault or you have to suture the vault to certain other surrounding structures something like ligaments now please concentrate for vault prolapse which type of suspension surgeries we are doing so what are they mesh sacral calpopexy can be performed or uterosacral suspension or sacrospinous suspension it's going to be very easy don't like you know uh, don't get confused it's very easy now i will show you certain images there you will get the whole idea guys before seeing those images please watch this video in this video something is missing what is that uterus is missing what you can see is only a vagina with the vaginal vault now watch this video what can happen see the vault the vaginal vault is prolapsing down okay so that's what is known as vault prolapse now what we can do for that vault prolapse see this vaginal vault with the help of a mesh is getting attached to the sacrum so it is mesh sacral calpopexy calpo means nothing but the vagina okay so with the help of a mesh i am doing mesh sacral calpopexy okay so this is a one option which you can do for the vaginal vault prolapse or you can do uterosacral ligament suspension with the help of uterosacral ligaments with the help of this uterosacral ligaments i am suspending the vaginal vault see this is the vaginal vault with the help of this uterosacral ligament okay i am just simply putting the sutures so that this vaginal vault is no longer falling down so this is what is known as uterosacral ligament suspension now let's talk about the sacrospinous fixation i don't know whether you can see or not see the the third image which i am talking about is the sacrospinous fixation very clear with the help of a sacrospinous ligament see the ligament which you can see over here it is a sacrospinous ligament and this is the vault of the vagina so now what i am doing is putting the sutures between the vault of the vagina and the sacrospinous ligament so it's a sacrospinous fixation so for vault prolapse what you can do for vault prolapse you can do three types of surgeries which are mesh sacral calpopexy or uterosacral suspension or sacrospinous fixation but important point is calpo suspension important important mcq see in the name it's in the name it's like you know sac sorry calpo suspension guys calpo means vagina suspension means sus like you know we are simply suspending it okay with the help of some sutures we are simply suspending guys calpo suspension is it a treatment option for vaginal vault prolapse no see the name like you know a simply tricks you calpo okay vaginal vault getting suspended so calpo suspension is a treatment for vaginal vault prolapse no why because calpo suspension or burj calpo suspension is something specifically done for stress urinary incontinence okay so for stress urinary incontinence we are going to do burj calpo suspension not for vaginal vault prolapse for vaginal vault prolapse we can do a sac uterosacral suspension or sacrospinous fixation or mesh sacral calpopexy okay now after this let's continue okay now what are these kegels exercises see these kegels exercises they are not a surgical things okay so far we have discussed the surgical management for the uterine prolapse now what we are discussing are like you know certain exercises which will prevent the uterus prolapse okay which will prevent the uterine prolapse from happening 
So what are they? Kegel's exercises, important MCQ. So what exactly are these Kegel's exercises? See, simply if you do exercise, your muscles will become strong. Am I right or not? Yes. In the same way, your pelvic floor muscles, the levator ani muscles, okay, they are the voluntary muscles. See, if you voluntary contract those muscles, hold them up and if you are simply relaxing, if you are doing this voluntarily 5-6 times a day, then the pelvic diaphragm will become strong enough to hold the uterus. See, when I am saying this, especially like, you know, uh, after the delivery, see, after the delivery, there is a chance that uterine prolapse can happen. So, how can you prevent that? You can ask the female to do this Kegel's exercises. So, if the female is performing, oh, repeat, if the female is performing this Kegel's exercises five to six times a day, then her pelvic floor muscles, okay, her pelvic floor muscles will become strong enough so that they can prevent the pelvic prolapse from happening. Okay, so these are what they will ask you about the Kegel's exercises. Now, let's discuss about the classification of prolapse. Guys, this topic is going to be very easy. Now, let's see the main important classification which you are using right now is the pop Q classification. What exactly is this pop Q classification? Pop Q means pelvic, pelvic argon. Okay, pelvic organ prolapse quantification. Okay, so pelvic organ prolapse quantification. See, it's a classification method which is used to classify the prolapse. So, where exactly the prolapsed organ is. So, based on the hymen with the reference to the hymen. For example, let me show you. Here, guys, please concentrate if this is the hymen. Okay. See, this is not the place where exactly the hymen will be. I'm just showing you for the reference. If this is the hymen, in reference to the hymen, we are going to say where exactly the prolapsed organ is. Is the prolapsed organ above the hymen or below the hymen? Above the hymen, how many centimeters? Or below the hymen, how many centimeters? Something like that. So, by using hymen as a reference point, if you are classifying the prolapse, that is pelvic organ prolapse quantification system. And there is also one more classification which uses the same hymen as a reference point. That is Baden Walker halfway classification. Okay, Baden Walker halfway classification also uses the hymen as a reference point to say where exactly the prolapsed organ is lying. Okay, now let's talk about the old classification which is the Shaw's classification. See, Shaw's classification uses introitus as a reference point. Now, let's talk about the Shaw's classification. Guys, Shaw's classification is using introitus as a reference point. We have already discussed. Now, according to Shaw's classification, there are four degrees of prolapse. First degree, second degree, third degree and fourth degree. All these degrees are based on introitus, where exactly the prolapsed organ is present. Okay, in reference to the introitus. See, if it is a first degree prolapse means the descent of cervix below the ischial spine but cervix still remains within the introitus. What does I mean by still the cervix is not coming up to the introitus. Okay. See this is the introitus. For example, if I am talking about the first degree, this is the introitus. Okay. Now the cervix is still inside the vagina. Okay. It have descended down the ischial spines but it is not up to the introitus. It is not up to the vaginal opening. That is first degree. Second degree means the cervix is coming up to the introitus, means it is coming up to the opening, so like you know, vaginal opening. It's coming, it's now here, okay, it's now near the opening of the vagina. Now, third degree is the cervix coming out of the introitus. First is inside the introitus, something like this. Second is up to the introitus. Third is totally out of the introitus. Okay, so third degree cervix is coming out of the introitus. Now, this is not the fourth degree, we are going to call it as prosidentia. What does it mean by prosidentia? The whole uterus is coming out of the vagina. Okay, the entire uterus prolapses outside the vulva. This is the prosidentia. Okay, so this is what is the Schoss classification based on the introitus as a reference point. But 
the important classification which is using these days is the pop q classification pelvic organ prolapse quantification method which is using the hymen as a reference point if you know this much this is enough okay now let's talk about vaginal prolapse guys so far what we have discussed we have discussed about the utero cervical prolapse now let's discuss about the vaginal prolapse guys this topic is going to be a very much easy for that you have to concentrate very much okay please concentrate guys see this image that this is vagina we all know that this is the vagina anterior to vagina what do we have guys guys please concentrate this is the anterior wall of the vagina anterior to anterior wall of vagina we are having this urethra and bladder okay we are having this bladder and urethra there is no doubt posterior to posterior wall of vagina what do we have guys i am dividing the posterior wall into three parts what are they see upper one third middle one third and lower one third upper one third okay upper one third middle one third and lower one third now see in close proximity to the upper one third of the posterior wall of the vagina means this part okay let me show you again yeah here what is closely related guys posteriorly there is this pouch of douglas am i right or not yes so pouch of douglas is in close proximity to the upper one third of the posterior wall of vagina there is no doubt in the middle one third the posterior wall is mainly in relation to the rectum yes the lower one third is in close proximity to the perineum okay this is the perineal region so now guys please concentrate on the anterior wall now, now let's talk about some abnormality with the anterior wall and it, it the association with the conditions for example if the anterior upper two third see i am talking about the anterior vaginal wall anterior upper two third means this structure anterior okay let me clear it for you so that everything will be clear now see this is the anterior wall this anterior upper two third if there is a defect what happens guys the bladder which is present anterior to it it will fall back it will fall back and it will create a depression or impression on the anterior wall it will fall back so that can cause what cystocele cystocele mainly cystocele and see if there is a defect in the lower one third of the vagina lower one third of the vagina is in close proximity to which structure urethra now urethra will fall back that can cause urethrocele don't worry i am going to show you the videos so that the concept will be clear so if there is any defect okay let me show you again if there is any defect in the upper two third of the anterior wall of vagina that will lead to cystocele the bladder will fall back okay the bladder will fall back now if there is any problem with the lower one third of the anterior wall of the vagina the urethra it may fall back causing a urethrocele but most of the time whenever there is cystocele urethrocel also will be there so i can collectively call as cysto urethrocel okay cystocele along with the urethrocel now okay anterior vaginal wall defects completed now let's talk about the posterior vaginal wall posterior vaginal wall is divided into how many parts upper one third middle one third lower one third if there is any problem okay let me show you here if there is any problem in the upper one third of the posterior wall of the vagina it is closely related to what pouch of douglas in the pouch of douglas what you will have intestines so that intestines will fall something like this okay the intestines are going to fall something like this okay anteriorly that is called as enterocele okay enterocele now if there is problem in the middle one third of the posterior wall of the vagina this rectum may fall something like this anteriorly that is known as rectocele and lower one third of the vagina okay now the lower one third of the vagina is in close proximity to the perineum if there is any defect in the lower one third of the vagina this perineum will fall down something like this that is called as laxed perineum 
So now let me show you some videos so that you will have a better concept. Now please concentrate here. In this image or in this video you can see a cystocele, how cystocele is forming. Guys, the concept is to have a cystocele, there should be defect in the anterior vaginal wall. No doubt, yeah. That too, upper two-third of the anterior vaginal wall. So, please concentrate in this area, upper two-third of the anterior vaginal wall. See what happens. Okay, you can clearly see that bladder is falling down. Okay, bladder, it's falling posteriorly and this is known as a cystocele. Okay, now let me show you one more time so that you will get it. See, there is no utero cervical prolapse. It is cystocele. This is the bladder. It's falling something like this. Okay, now in the next video, you can see. Yeah. Now, please concentrate here in this video. Yeah. What's happening guys? See, it's a rectocele. Okay, rectum, it is falling anteriorly and causing a rectocele. So, rectocele, to have a rectocele, where should be problem? In the posterior wall, that to middle one third of the posterior wall. If there is problem in the upper one third of the posterior wall, you can have an enterocele. If you have any problem in the lower one third of the posterior wall, you are going to have a lax perineum. Okay, now, guys, now, how we have to manage the vaginal prolapse, anterior vaginal wall prolapses causing cystourethrocele's and posterior vaginal wall prolapse causing introcele, rectocele and lax perineum, how we are going to manage? See, management is very simple. For anterior vaginal wall prolapses, that is cystocele and urethrocele, what you have to repair? Repair or make the anterior vaginal wall strong enough. So, it is anterior Calpo means vagina, raphi means just treatment. So, anterior calpo raphi, anterior calpo raphi is the management for cystocele and urethrocele. Now, for introcele, introcele is something posterior. So, now what we have to do for introcele, what type of surgeries can be done are Mascovid surgery, Halban repair, and Meckel caldoplasty, important MCQs. For enterocele, how you are going to manage enterocele? Enterocele is because of the defect in the posterior vaginal wall, upper one third. That can be managed with Moscovid surgery, Halban surgery and Meckel caldoplasty. Now, how you have to manage? Rectocele and lax perineum, guys. Rectocele and lax perineum, they are managed with posterior. Why? Because you have to repair the posterior wall. You are not supposed to repair the anterior wall. Anterior wall repair should be done for cystocele and urethrocele. Now, if there is rectocele and lax perineum, what you can do is posterior calpo perineoraphy. Why? Because there is also this lax perineum, right? So, you are doing calpo perineoraphy posterior. Posterior calpo perineo. It is not simply posterior calporaphy. Why? Because there is also this perineum. So, posterior calpo perineoraphy. It doesn't matter whether the female is a paras, nulliparous, it doesn't matter. She is a multiparous woman or nulliparous woman, she is a young woman, older woman, it doesn't matter. See, managing utero cervical prolapse depends on the age and parity. Am I right or not? Yes. Whether you have to do sling surgery, whether you have to do um, Father Gill's Manchester surgery, or whether you have to do Wadmoyo hysterectomy or ring pacery depends on the parity and age. But for managing the vaginal prolapse, parity and age doesn't matter. For everyone, if there is cystourethrocele, you have to do the anterior calporaphy. That's it. If there is a posterior, like you know, wall defects, or if there is a rectocele and lax perineum, what you have to do is you have to do posterior calporaphy. It's one and the same for everyone. Okay. Now, vaginal prolapse also completed. The management of vaginal prolapse done. Now, after this, there is a very small topic, but you can expect an MCQ from that. What is that? It is D-Lancy levels of uterine supports. MCQs will be coming from this area. Now, let's talk. Guys, according to the D-Lancy levels, there are three levels. Level 1 supports, level 2 supports, and level 3 supports. 
what are these level 1 supports level 1 supports are sacro uterine ligament or uterosacral ligaments okay see it's very simple we are coming from top structures to below structures see this is the cervix okay the structure which i am showing you right now this is the cervix to the cervix which ligaments are attached just tell me guys transversely what type of ligaments are there guys cardinal ligaments mackenrod's ligaments or transverse cervical ligaments okay cardinal ligaments are the level one supports okay see posteriorly which ligaments are there these are the uterosacral ligaments okay well and good now see this canal which i am showing you right now here this is the vagina now vagina have two walls this is the anterior wall this is the posterior wall now guys please concentrate anterior wall i can call something like this visico vaginal fascia why i am calling like visico vaginal fascia see i shouldn't call anterior wall as visico vaginal fascia but what i am trying to put into you, your mind is see this is vesical urinary bladder visico this is vagina so in between them there is this visico vaginal fascia okay well and good posteriorly there is this rectum so rectum and vagina so it is recto vaginal fascia so anterior to the anterior vaginal wall there is this visico vaginal fascia and posteriorly there is this recto vaginal fascia in between them there is this vagina now what i am trying to say the level 2 supports are the level 1 supports are what uterosacral ligaments and cardinal ligaments the level 2 supports are recto vaginal fascia and visico vaginal fascia apart from them there is also one more level 2 support what is that i can't show you in this image so that i am showing you one more image what is this see this is the cervix here is the cervix see to the cervix which ligaments are attached it is the transverse cervical ligaments and the uterosacral ligaments which are considered as the level 1 supports okay well and good now level 2 supports are what recto vaginal fascia and visico vaginal fascia okay well and good one more level 2 support is there what is that see these structures okay these structures which are present side what are those structures guys they are known as arcus tendinous fascia okay so level 2 supports are arcus tendinous fascia visico vaginal septum recto vaginal septum or recto vaginal fascia okay well and good level 1 supports are cardinal ligaments and uterosacral ligaments okay well and good now what are the level 3 supports guys please concentrate in this image the level 3 supports are the perineal body here yeah. see perineal body also supports the uterus okay all the muscles which are attaching to the perineal body they will support the uterus but for now what are the level 3 supports perineal body and see please concentrate here this transverse muscle which is something coming like this okay this transverse muscle what is this muscle it is the transverse perineal muscle okay deep transverse perineal muscle forming our urogenital diaphragm okay that's the level 3 support okay so urogenital diaphragm and perineal body they are forming our level 3 support so level 1 supports are at the level of upper one third of the vagina yes upper one third at the level of cervix level 2 supports are at the middle one third of the vagina anteriorly visico vaginal septum posteriorly recto vaginal septum sideways it is arcus tendinous fascia now level 3 supports are at the lower one third of the vagina which are they they are perineal body and the urogenital diaphragm now why i am saying this because defect in level 1 will lead to what see defect in level 1 which means the higher structures the uterosacral ligaments or the transverse ligament are not proper they are not tight enough they are not able to hold the uterus so what happens there will be vault prolapse or uterocervical prolapse or there can be enterocele if the transverse ligaments or the uterosacral ligaments if there is a problem with those structures what happen guys there can be uterocervical prolapse the cervix can come down something like this okay the cervix can come into the vagina that is cervical prolapse okay so there can be cervical prolapse or uterocervical prolapse you can call and there can be enterocele above structures there can be enterocele now there can be vault prolapse or epical prolapse possible 
If there is arcus tendinis fascia defect, vesicovaginal septum defect or rectovaginal septum defect. Guys, think logically and say. Please concentrate in this image, guys. Anteriorly, what do you have, guys? Anteriorly, there is this vesicovaginal septum. If there is problem with this vesicovaginal septum, what you can have? You can have a cystocele or even you can have a urethrocele. So, cystocele and urethrocele are possible with the defects in the vesicovaginal septum which is a level 2 support. Okay. And a defect in a rectovaginal septum can lead to a rectocele. True. Okay. So, that's what I have shown you here. Say defect in any of these level 2 supports can cause anterior and posterior vaginal wall prolapses which include cystourethrocele and rectocele. It's not just cystocele also. Uh, uh, sorry, it's mainly cystocele. Okay. It's not a urethrocele. It's a mainly cystocele. Defect in this vis vesicovaginal septum mainly causes the cystocele, not the urethrocele. Why? Because urethrocele is something seen. Urethrocele is something seen, especially if there is a defect in a urogenital diaphragm and perineal body. Okay, so if there is a defect in this urogenital diaphragm and perineal body, like on the below structures. So below structures means, for example, please concentrate here. Below structures, there can be a possibility of anteriorly urethrocele and posteriorly laxed perineum. Okay, see, what I am trying to put into your mind is, I am just like, you know, sum, uh, summing it up. If there is a defect in the above structures, Prolapse can also be happening in the above structures. What does I mean by if there is a defect in the cardinal ligaments or uterosacral ligaments, prolapse will be happening in the organs which are more above. That is the cervical prolapse can happen or the epical prolapse can happen. If there is defect in the middle structures, that is the middle one third of the vagina, you can expect a, a cystocele and even you can expect a rectocele. If there is a defect in the lower structures, that is the lower one third of the vagina, that is the perineal body and urogenital diaphragm, you are going to have urethrocele anteriorly and lax perineum posteriorly. Okay, we have discussed all the important topics and even we have discussed the management for the vaginal prolapse. I hope the lecture is helpful. Thank you.